Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome. My name is David Scott. I'm the chairman of LGT Destra, and we're delighted to welcome you to this webinar on a sustainable future. With me today, we've got Phoebe Stone, who is the head of sustainable investing at LGT Vestra, and Robert Roland Smith, who I'm sure many of you will have uh, read some of his essays that um, he did for us maybe some years ago uh, when we did a, a project with the School of Life. And Robert's been incredibly um, helpful to us in terms of our communications with our clients, in terms of a lot of the areas that are probably more philosophical in their approach. So we look forward to hearing from him shortly. Um, so I just want to give a very uh, quick introduction uh, to sustainability. It's something that is very much at the core of what we aim to do. And I think the recent events with COVID have probably made us, and, and most people I think, probably think a lot more about uh, some of the other matters around us that perhaps in the hurly-burly of um, fuzzy lives or whatever we've probably forgotten about. And I think obviously the immediate thing was sort of our society. And I think as we saw the tremendous work that the NHS did and just generally the reliance that we have on a lot of people uh, that were perhaps not prominent figures that you read about in the papers, I think it probably made us all realize uh, that actually the work that some of these people do is really what actually keeps our society together. And I think it's certainly been very useful if, if that alone um, to make us all realize and appreciate uh, the, the work of the NHS and the carers and all the volunteers, all the supporters. Um, so I, hopefully I think that has uh, made us aware of society, uh, which is obviously a key part in, in sustainability. And on the environment, I think it's another area where a lot of people probably didn't really pay too much attention to it. There's always been the people who are very strong environmentalists for, for many decades. And I know many people sort of um, probably poo-pooed at the sort of just interest groups sort of talking their own sort of story. But I think, um, again, being at home, realizing what's going around you when you looked at uh, pictures from satellites of LA and Shanghai and other big cities, and you realize how crystal clear uh, the air was compared to what it was, it really brought home with a very strong uh, resonance just actually the damage that we are doing to our environment through just our day-to-day -day business and traveling around. So I think having realized that you know, even a short space of time, like a month or two, um, reduction in cars and transport and energy and business generally, if it can have that effect, then you know, how do we ensure that we actually carry on with this sort of approach? Because I think it was Venice as well. I think uh, dolphins were spotted in, in, in the lagoon, or maybe they've always been in the lagoon, but we've never been able to sort of see it. So I, I think those are very powerful messages. And I, I suppose being an internal optimist, um, always sort of believe that you can take something out, good out of uh, something bad that happens to us. And so I think um, you know, my one hope is that as we go forward, uh, we realize that all of us owe a duty uh, to ourselves and to our family, society, and the environment that we live in uh, to make sure that we're more responsible uh, in our decisions, uh, you know, what we eat, what we consume, how we go about things in life generally. So I think sustainability is something now that obviously people are talking about. It's a lot more of a buzzword. Um, I hope it doesn't just become a buzzword um, or a marketing gimmick, and I hope it's a lot more sort of deep felt by, by many people. And I think there's now sufficient volume of, of people behind it. I think we can actually make a meaningful difference. But anyway, I'm gonna pass over to Phoebe, I think now who's gonna run through uh, some slides and then Robert um, will then have his slot off that and then we'll uh, collect it all together at the end. So thank you from me, Phoebe, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, some really interesting um, insights. Um, uh, by way of introduction, my name is Phoebe Stone and head up the Sustainable Proposition here at LGT Vestra. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes talking a little bit about the proposition, the portfolios uh, that we're running. Importantly, what we're doing as a business with regards to managing the impact on the environment and society around us. But first of all, I'm going to start by running through what we already know. Our world is getting hotter. This slide clearly shows photos from Australia, 
uh, demonstration of the uh, temperature rising over the last 50 years, uh, and of course, uh, glaciers melting. 97% of scientists agree that this is due to carbon emission rates, which have gone up threefold since 1960. On top of that, we have the massively increasing global population, which is set to reach 50 billion people, sorry, 10, 10 billion people by 2050. Importantly, the distribution of this population is also changing. In 1950, 750 million people lived in cities. Today, that figure represents 4.2 billion. By 2050, 6.7 billion of us will live in urbanized areas, which will be almost 70% of our total global population. Interestingly, 35% of the growth of that urbanized population from today to 2050 is going to come from three countries, India, China, and Nigeria. Nigeria is the seventh most populated country worldwide today. By 2050, it will be the third most populated country worldwide with 400 million people living in a country the size of Texas. Climate change migration, the movement of people as a result of changes in climate is already happening. And it's been estimated by the World Bank that it's going to impact 143 million people worldwide. Examples like crops failing, extreme drought, uh, really impacting communities in places like Central Asia. But the opposite is happening in North America, where as a result of sea levels rising, entire towns are having to evacuate. And the same is happening for entire island regions in the Oceania. However, importantly, the World Bank have also uh, estimated that with action, this climate change migration can be mitigated by up to 80%. To show you a demonstration of what this action might look like, I've got there a chart from IRENA, which is the split of renewable energy as a proportion of the primary energy supply across four regions, China, Europe, India, and the US. In 2015, renewable energy only represented low, single, low double digits or single digits as a percentage of the total energy supply. By 2050, it looks like it's going to represent between 60 to 70%. Now, obviously, <clears throat> that's a seismic shift that's going to take place over the next 30 years. And what that says to us is there's an extremely inv interesting and important investment opportunity that needs to take place to ensure that transition can happen and the infrastructure is in place for it to do so. Our resources are running out. By 2050, we will need to increase food production by between 60 to 70%. Today, demand for water is growing at twice population growth. So by 2050, 5 billion people are going to live in water stressed areas. For those of you who uh, can hopefully see the slide here, this uh, quite disturbing image represents something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It might have been something you've heard about before. This is one of five plastic islands that exists in the world today. This one is in fact the largest. It represents an area three times the size of France. Over two trillion pieces of physical plastic floating around in the oceans. It's been estimated that there's going to be more plastic in the sea than fish by weight by 2050. And studies today have demonstrated that over 50% of aquatic animals have ingested a piece of plastic. So these are some major challenges that we face as a global community. Climate change, increased urbanization, resource depletion and the plastics crisis. But they also tap into some really important investment megatrends. So around climate change, investment in electric vehicles, infrastructure around uh, charging those electric vehicles, and there's a lot in the press today about that, um, hydrogen vehicles, renewable technology, air pollution technology, so uh, detecting the air pollution, minimizing that air pollution where possible. As urbanized areas grow, we need to make sure that the buildings that are being built or indeed retrofitted are increasingly energy efficient, that infrastructure systems are sustainable, and that the people are moving to these cities have access to uh, sustainable, responsible uh, finance. Importantly, also hygiene levels need to, to increase as these urbanized areas grow. 
As we continue to deplete our resources, food needs to be made more efficiently and each bit of food needs to have higher and higher levels of nutritional value. We need to make sure that agricultural systems are increasingly sustainable and water, recycling of water, treating of water is done to a greater extent. Finally, the plastics crisis. Plastic is a very hot topic and has really grown in terms of importance to, to the local populace and, and, and individuals here um, in the world. That's really as a result of a huge amount of focus triggered mainly by David Attenborough's um, Blue Planet, where, where the, uh, the turtle was drowning in the, in the sea of plastic. But plastic is a very cheap, durable, light material. The idea of eradicating plastic doesn't make sense. The, the idea of eradicating single-use plastic absolutely does. And what we need to be working towards is a world where there's an amount of plastic in existence at any one time, and that plastic gets used over and over again, the so-called circular economy. But there's an awful lot of infrastructure required to facilitate that system of a circular economy. So there's a, a need to invest in, in that kind of infrastructure. So these are some, some of the challenges that we face, but we could definitely sit here and discuss many, many more of them. Helpfully, the United Nations has defined the major challenges that they believe our world is facing. And they're called the UN Sustainable Development Goals or UN SDGs. These were defined by the United Nations and ratified by all 193 countries back in 2015 and launched in 2016. The idea behind them is that the UN has defined the major challenges that the world faces so that individual countries can understand where to allocate capital in order to create a more peaceful and prosperous world. And the idea behind them is that these are solved by 2030. So within the next 10 years, obviously an extremely ambitious framework to, for example, eradicate poverty, number one, um, create uh, infrastructure uh, that's sustainable and equitable, make sure that everyone has fair access to education and healthcare. The other major challenge with these goals is the cost. And it's been estimated that they're going to cost between five and seven trillion US dollars every year for the next 10 years. One trillion has been committed by UN member states, but that leaves a funding gap of up to almost six trillion US dollars a year. But if we put that six trillion in the context of financial markets, the total value of listed equity and bond markets comes to about 200 trillion. To put that 200 trillion in context, because it's an extraordinary number, that's 10 times the size of the world's biggest economy, the US economy. So that is an awful lot of financial firepower in the hands of investors. And if investors increasingly look to reroute capital flows towards the companies that are looking to solve some of these challenges or even address some of them within the operations, companies that are striving to do better to improve their sustainable performance, then we could go some way to filling that funding gap. But not all of the UN SDGs are investable. So in the portfolios that we run, we've taken the UN Sustainable Development Goals and extracted the ones that you are able to create an investment framework and investment thesis out of, and created four sustainable investment pillars, which form the framework to our sustainable investment thinking. Some of the UN SDGs have been excluded, like number one, uh, no poverty, the eradication of poverty. We will need philanthropic capital and government effort to look to solve that challenge. Equally 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Obviously, that requires international collaboration uh, to create those systems. So the, US, the, the sustainable investment pillars, two of them are social on the left-hand side and two of them environmental. And all of the holdings in the portfolios that we run align to one or more of those pillars. And what that means for clients, for investors, is that you're able to understand not just the asset allocation exposure of your portfolio or the geographic exposure, two metrics that you'll probably be fairly comfortable with and familiar with, but actually the thematic exposure to help you really understand uh, where your money's going and the themes that are being expressed and addressed through your portfolio. We've written white papers connected to each of these pillars to help you dive a little bit further, to help you understand the challenges that we face, um, and importantly, some of the solutions 
and the companies held in the portfolios that are looking to uh, provide solutions to some of those biggest challenges. Some of the funds that are held in the portfolios, in fact, go as far as measuring the impact that's generated from the companies held in them. So this is um, a, an environmental markets equity fund. It's run by a company called Impacts. And the fund looks to invest in sectors such as pollution control, energy efficiency, renewable energy production, um, and sustainable water um, recycling. So at the end of each year, this fund house produce a report for clients to really determine and help, help you understand the impact, environmental impact of the investment in this fund. This is over and above the really strong financial return that this fund generates. So at the end of each year, you can understand the environmental impact in the CO2 emissions that have been avoided from investing in this fund, the amount of renewable energy that's been generated, the amount of water that's been recycled, and the amount of waste that's been recycled. These are really powerful metrics and really help you to understand the type of environmental impact that can be generated from investing in companies that are, are looking to deliver um, in these key areas. It's also possible to invest for impact in the fixed income market in the bond space. This is more uh, surprising to, to most clients who, who understand sustainability within the context of investing in companies via the equity market. But in fact, the bond market is, is very interesting from an impact perspective because it's possible to invest via bonds in specific projects. If, those pro if that project is ring fenced and is an environmental project, the bond is called a green bond. Or if it's a social project, which is being pursued by the company, it's called a social bond. So this bond fund is run by Threadneedle in conjunction with the Big Issue Invest, which is the investment arm of the Big Issue. And every year, again, this uh, fund measures and publishes the positive impact from a social perspective. So you're understanding over and above the financial return that you're getting, the amount of people that have access to social housing, the amount of support and development in certain areas of the UK, and in this case, the amount of people that have had access to affordable banking services. So real tangible metrics around the positive impact delivered. This is touching on a couple of, of uh, points that David made, um, and I'd absolutely concur that, that COVID-19 has really provided um, an inflection point. Um, clearly, we are moving through an enormous health crisis, a social crisis, um, and desperately trying to not let it become an economic crisis. But also what it's done is provide um, a respite to our environment. This respite can be seen very clearly on the slide in front of you. And David mentioned the amount of pollution level drops that we've seen. This shows nitrous dioxide levels in Italy, pre-lockdown and during lockdown, dramatic decrease there. Carbon emission rates in China fell by 25%. Carbon, um, mono, uh, carbon uh, oxide levels fell by 50% in New York. So dramatic changes to the way our environmental environment is, is uh, flourishing. Um, whilst we don't think this is a viable solution, uh, lockdown is not a viable solution to the changes to challenges our environment faces, what it really has done is helped people understand the damage that, that we are causing. The other thing I think that, that, that COVID has helped, um, uh, helped push or help grow the momentum for is higher levels of scrutiny expected from corporates and from governments. And the crisis that Boohoo are moving through right now um, with regards to the, the modern slaves that they potentially had in their um, factories in Leicester, I think really demonstrates how much importance we as a, a social community put on these, these issues. And I do wonder if there would have been such a huge fallout from that scandal two years ago. Uh, my sense is that, that we really care about these issues more and more. Um, and I think this is driving a lot of people to think about how their portfolio is investing invested and try, wanting to be able to express these views through, through, their, through their pension, through their ISA and through their general investment account. The final piece for me is what we're doing as a company and this is crucially uh, important. Uh, we wouldn't be offering a sustainable investment solution to our clients if we weren't taking these issues very, very seriously as a business. LGT, our parent company, have been 
working in the sustainable space for many, many years. They've been offering sustainable investment solutions to their clients for quite some time. But we also look at the impact that we have on the environment and society. And LGT are quite unusual. Since 2010, LGT have measured the uh, level of carbon emissions, the paper usage, um, and the split between renewable energy and non-renewable energy going all the way back to 2010. And that is a quite unusual for a business of our global span to have been measuring and publishing that data for the last 10 years. We have a sustainability strategy that rolls in five year periods. So we're now in the 2025 sustainability strategy and it's made up of three uh, pillars. The first, the solutions that we offer to clients and the sustainable portfolios that we run very much fall under that pillar. Second of all, the uh, impact that we have on the environment um, and society around us. So we allocate 10% of group dividends to philanthropic activities via the LGT Foundation. Um, we have environmental targets that we specifically focus on. And we also collaborate with a range of different organizations uh, all over the world, from UN Global Compact to the World Economic Forum. And our, our group CEO each year talks at Davos on behalf of the World Economic Forum to really demonstrate the importance, uh, the important role that companies like LGT have in driving sustainability forward. I'm going to finish uh, just touching uh, a little bit more on the environmental targets. So we want to reduce carbon emission rates by 20% within the next five years, energy consumption by 30%, paper consumption by 30%, which has been pretty easy in lockdown. In fact, we've reduced our paper consumption by 90% since lockdown started. Um, but we also want to be using 100% renewable energy globally. Easy here in the UK or in Europe, much, much harder when we have bought, an office, uh, bought a business in India last year and set up an office in, in Bangkok. So these are stretching targets, these are ambitious targets, uh, and the way that we do business and operate, uh, we take extremely seriously. Um, and it's a really, really important part of what we're trying to deliver. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna pass now on to Robert, um, who's going to give you um, some brief insights into the way he sees sustainability. Thank you so much, Phoebe. That was uh, fascinating. And I'm going to try and pick up on one or two of the themes you mentioned there as well. But before that, we're going to risk something never previously tried in the history of mankind, which is a little bit of technological innovation. I mean, they say in theatre, you should never work with people or animals. I think when on Zoom, you should probably limit things to Zoom and not add any other layers of technology, but we are going to try. So I am assuming that most of you, if not all of you, will have with you an extra screen nearby. So say you're watching this on a, um, say you're watching this on a uh, laptop or a desktop, you might also have your mobile phone next to you or an iPad or vice versa. So if you do have a second screen available within your reach, if you could uh, seize that and uh, Go to your web browser, whatever that is, Chrome or uh, Firefox, Safari, whatever it is. Go to your browser of choice. And uh, once there, if you can simply enter a very straightforward web address, which is menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, as you can see on the slide there, go to menti.com. And it'll ask you for a code and if you could enter the code that's uh, seen there on the screen, 947998, you should, with luck, touch wood, fingers crossed, uh, then uh, have a, see, uh, uh, a screen presented to you with this question. What word do you associate with sustainability? So uh, if you can take a moment then just to fill in the the box, I think it's just one word we want. And we'll see what uh, associations there are that are triggered by the word sustainability. And we'll see them coming up on the screen as indeed they're already beginning to do so. Um, so this is a bit like a kind of live sound cloud or, or tag bubble thing. Um, and you can see the words environments bang in the center there, ethical, future, recycling. Longevity is an interesting one. I'm going to 
I want to talk a little bit about longevity, um, social responsibility. Uh, what else have we got? Future proof. That's a, that's a cool phrase. Doing good, the planet, perpetuity, protection, our children, circularity. Fee, we obviously touched on circularity a little bit. Common sense. There's a good one. Okay, well, that gives us a sense of um, some of the things involved, you know, some of the associations that uh, occur to us when we think about sustainability. And I'd like to pick up on a couple of those, but then go, I guess, a little bit uh, deeper or higher or take a step back because my approach, I guess, is slightly more from a you know, philosophical perspective. And I want to look at the kind of underlying, some of the underlying models behind uh, behind sustainability and, and what, it, what it means. And uh, Phoebe, you, you know, during your presentation, you mentioned the word resources quite a lot. And uh, clearly there is, seems to be a direct uh, tension or calculation to be made between people and resources. Basically, is there enough to go around for the number of people there are? So that's the, um, that, that's the as it were, conceptual basis of all of this discu discussion, people, resources. Have we got more people and resources, re more resources than people? Where, where's the tipping point between the two? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about both people and resources, and specifically money rather than environmental resources. Um, but uh, as I say, looking at things from a slightly more philosophical and dare I say, existential point of view. So um, let's take the idea of people. Uh, now, there are these huge projections for population growth until 2050, although you may have uh, heard uh, only yesterday a report published actually that um, we may see population begin to decline again in the uh, second half of the 21st century. But we have an immediate or medium term problem over the next 30 years of an ever expanding population. And, and, and why is that? And it's partly because uh, just the more people are, there are in the world, the more children will be born. Although overall, birth rates are, are coming down with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that's, that's kind of known, uh, as it were, as an economic or social fact. But the question, I suppose, from a philosophical point of view is, do, you know, wh do, why should we have so many people? And why should we want them to live so long? Um, because nearly all of the problems we have related to climate change are to do with the fact that there are just too many human beings on the planet needing resources. And in, uh, we have to say not just needing resources, but taking resources they don't need. So consumerism, I suppose, could be defined by that. Um, the satisfaction of a want rather than satisfaction of a need. So, um, uh, you know, in a certain sense, there, you know, there are too many people. So we've got uh, too many people and we don't seem to have a lively debate about what the right number of people for the planet ought to be except at this level of resources it's like well let's max out until the point where there aren't enough more uh, resources left and then we'll kind of we'll plateau seems a pretty crude way to think about uh, how many people there should be on the earth especially as you know contraception is now widely available in a way that it, it wasn't you know even a couple of generations ago so that's the first thing, that's something there about longevity or the length of life. And, and that was one of the words in our SoundCloud a moment ago. And it forces us to think about, you know, uh, how many people there are and, and now how long people should, should live for. Because, and again, this is obviously a philosophical point. We have got into the habit of thinking that uh, it's, it, it's best to have as long a life as possible. And uh, we have lots of the uh, resources and technologies and medicines to be able to sustain life um, at hugely uh, uh, expanded lengths compared to, as I say, even a couple of generations ago. The trouble is, of course, that uh, quantity of life doesn't always go together with quality of life. And we see increasingly, particularly in the West, that people, while living longer, experience uh, much higher levels, particularly of of dementia. So there's that, I mean, there's pretty fundamental questions for us to ask, answer, I think, as a, as a species, you know, do we want people to live longer if they're actually living less well? Um, so as I said, you know, there are some kind of, kind of fundamental 
questions uh, at the heart of this, but I want to actually spend most of the time focusing not on the people side of the equation, although that's, that's fundamental, but more on the resources uh, side of the equation or the, particularly the money side of the equation. And I'm, I'm no economist, I'm not a banker, I know nothing about uh, the world of finance really. But I want to look at this, I suppose, from the point of view of two uh, philosophers, Karl Marx and Max Weber. It's with, uh, I must say, a little bit of irony and uh, sense of mirth that I uh, looked forward and anticipated the, you know, a session talking to um, a wealth management company about uh, Marxism, but that is what's going to happen. So hold it onto your hats, guys. Um, be prepared to throw your screens across the room. I do want to talk a, bit, a little bit about Marx and, uh, and Weber. So um, Marx has this very interesting idea that, you know, say you buy a bicycle, um, although I actually had the experience of trying to buy a bicycle recently and, and uh, came out with zilch because Halford was sold out and I couldn't even get my existing bike fixed. But say uh, you have, you buy a shiny new bicycle. Uh, Marx says, in his analysis of economics in the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. He says, well, it has at least two forms of value. Uh, it has a use value, you know, I can ride it, and it has an exchange value in that I can sell it. So it has at least two forms of, of value. And, and, and for Marx, kind of all commodities are like that, uh, essentially. Um, but I think this uh, notion of exchange value is quite interesting because it comes to it, it sort of comes to the heart of what the philosophy of money is. And uh, uh, if you, the the origin of money uh, was the invention of a neutral substance without value in itself that served as a kind of passageway between two objects. So I can sell my bicycle for your smartphone. You can sell you know your smartphone for a new kitchen gadget and so on. The money itself doesn't have quality, if you like. It's, to use the technical term anyway, uh, it's fungible, fungible. And fungible means something that facilitates something else to happen, but is kind of absent of characteristics in itself. So money in its origin was simply this translator. It's like, um, I've got a goat, you've got a cow, I want what you've, you, I don't want the, get the cow, but I want the money you know, th that I can use in turn to, to buy the things that I do want. So it, it breaks the pattern of kind of direct object to object exchange and it's brilliant invention in that sense. Um, but, uh, and Marx kind of hints at this, um, that very kind of early on in the history of money, people recognize that money has a value not just in terms of exchange, you know, it's the thing which allows me to swap my, you know, my piano for a guitar or whatever. Uh, it's also um, something that can accumulate in and of itself. So money, in other words, has two functions. One is this exchange value, but the other is value in and of itself. And this for Marx is what capital is. It's when you start to perceive money almost as an end, uh, an end in itself. It's not that you're about to use it to buy something. And on the contrary, capital is, is almost by definition the money you don't spend, uh, the money that doesn't have an exchange uh, value. And for Marx, of course, this is the origin of capitalism and it allows people to uh, build uh, capital beyond the, their immediate needs. Because at the other end of the spectrum, people who don't have very much money, all of their money is used for exchange. You know, I've got this money, now I can go to the supermarket and buy, put dinner on the, on the table tonight for my kids. So that's a, that's a kind of privilege, if you like, that comes with capital. It's, it's money you don't have to spend. And um, for Marx, what, you know, the problem with capitalism is that the people who have capital not only can build it up because they don't have to spend it because they've got enough to meet their material needs most of the time, but they can actually then invest that um, on top. And of course, we're talking precisely today in the context of investment strategies, in this case, sustainable investment strategies, but investment strategies. And investment, of course, is about taking capital and increasing its value, still without necessarily exchanging it for anything. And that, for Marx, is what increases the, uh, the, the, the difference between rich and poor. And for Marx, you know, the entire history uh, is the history of class struggle, as he will say. So that's what uh, kind of that's the sort of 
journey, I suppose, that money went on from this exchange value to this kind of inherent capital value. And, and I'm going to talk about other forms of economy in a second, but I just want to contrast that uh, for a moment with a contemporary of Karl Marx, an anthropologist, sociologist really, called Max Weber, who uh, from pretty much the same premise drew an almost entirely opposite conclusion. So um, Weber said, well, look, um, if I work hard during the week and I get paid a hundred pounds at the end of the week, I have some choices with that hundred pounds. I can spend a hundred pounds to meet my material needs because those are my material needs. I have a hundred pounds worth of need and I'm down to zero at the end of the week and start again the following week. He said, that's fine. But if you are a good Protestant, yes, and I know it sounds like a weird segue or chicane, but if you're a good Protestant, you can actually deny yourself a little bit. You don't have to meet all your needs. You can go without one meal a week, for example, and you can put some money aside. So you can, instead of spending a hundred pounds a week to meet all your material needs, you put 10 pounds uh, aside, you spend 90, and now you have some capital and you've gained that capital by denying yourself, not a luxury necessarily, it could even be a necessity, but it comes from, in uh, Weber's view, an actually an ethical, moral, a religious, technically a Protestant instinct to not indulge yourself because it's the not indulging yourself, the abstinence that allows that uh, capital to build up. And so whereas for Marx, the accumulation of capital is the very sign of moral iniquity, um, a, a kind of evil um, that allows people to make money out of money, for Weber, it's the, it's the opposite. It is the demonstration of virtue. So people who have lots of capital are, in Weber's worldview, uh, kind of symbol of paragons, almost, of virtue. The question for them is, you know, what they then do with all of that money. And that's one of the reasons why you have in the Protestant tradition in lots of um, uh, 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 foundations to give money away, uh, to set up schools, and so on. So sort of same conceptual basis, but it takes you in a completely different direction. Marx on the one hand, Weber on the other hand. And I, I'll finish in a minute, because I want to bring back um, Phoebe and David, if he's still there, back into the conversation and widen it out again. But I just want to leave you with a thought about th actually three types of economy. So, you know, Phoebe mentioned the circular economy, which is about non-extractive modes of uh, engaging with the economy. Like we don't take more out of the ground, we don't take any more oil, making plastic, running motor cars, we don't take any more minerals, whatever. So we don't, it's a non-extractive mode of running the economy. That's called the circular economy. It's very big in the world of fashion at the moment. I have a big fashion client, you know, very much trying to recycle clothing. I, I think I'm right in saying cotton is actually the biggest crop in the world. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that, I think it's the case. And of course the fashion industry uses vast amounts of cotton and all the water uh, that, that goes with that. Um, of course, the question for the fashion industry is then how to um, how to position recycled clothing as value added rather than value depleted. And of course, the argument is, well, uh, almost by definition, recycled fashion ought to have scarcity value because there aren't as many copies, if you like, of the same T-shirt, if you go into Topshop, of a vintage T-shirt as there would be of a, of a new one you know, in Primark. So that's the circular economy. And the circular economy is an answer to really the kind of what we know as the, the growth economy for want of a better word. And that's the, the capitalist mode that we've all worked on um, since at least the industrial revolution, which is the production consumption economy. You know, let's keep consuming, that will drive uh, production, production will drive consumption. Overall, there'll be growth, uh, standards will increase, uh, greater affluence comes greater health and all the rest of it. We know that argument. That's the sort of standard growth economy model mindset to which the circular economy is an, is an answer. But as I say, I just want to leave you with a final thought, which is not about the growth economy or even the circular economy, but the gift economy. Now, the gift economy, that lots of work has been done, particularly among anthropologists around the gift economy, and I'm just going to give you a, a couple of examples of it. Um, so there's a, there was a very famous book uh, written by a man called Lewis Hyde, uh, I think published in the 80s, 
it's been reprinted since. But he talks a lot about uh, our relationship with nature and he has some beautiful stories. Uh, and one which kind of particularly struck me is about a um, American Indian tribe um, in Kais, where was it? Somewhere near the Canadian border who essentially spent their time salmon fishing. Well, that was one of their kind of main activities and one of their main sources of food. Um, but every time they would, um, I mean, there was a lot of sort of um, magical belief around salmon fishing because they thought salmon had a sort of um, uh, kind of sacred properties. But anyway, they, what matters most about this story is that every time they would catch and kill and eat a salmon, they were very careful to separate the the uh, the animal, the, the the meat from the bones, and to, and to make a ceremony of putting the bones back into the water, into the river. And they believed that this was a uh, this was the fundamental uh, relationship to nature that we should have. It's one of give and take. So you know, nature gives us a gift; we give a gift back in return, uh, rather than simply extracting. Because you know, now most of us who have you know, fill up a salmon from the supermarket or at a restaurant where we used to go out to. I mean, you know, of course, the bones of that fish, wherever it's come from, are not being returned to the sea or the river whence it came. And it's a charming story. Um, you might say, so what? Well, it's quite interesting when those particular uh, rivers in that area of that tribe was, was colonized, essentially, and the salmon uh, hunting was taken over by the colonizers. Um, they didn't follow that practice, of course. They just ate the salmon, tossed the bones away or, or whatever. And they found that even though they weren't overfishing, the stocks of salmon uh, markedly declined in that area. Now, that's just one of numerous examples that Lewis, Hart's, Lewis Hyde cites in his book about uh, what he calls the gift economy, in which he says has a kind of sacred quality to it. And I like that story and I've you've probably had the experience at some point where you've given something and then unexpectedly had something back later on you've given without the intention of receiving in turn but something good has happened it's almost like karma if you like and of course if you give a gift with the expectation of being given something back it's almost by definition by definition not a gift it's already a commodity so that there is a difference between the two so um and you know, going further, you could say whatever a gift is, it's something that didn't need to be given. It's always extra. It's always a bonus. Uh, it's a, to use the technical term, it's an economic, but not uneconomic, but an economic. It lies outside the economy. It's not within a fixed closed system. Um, the word economy comes from the law of the home, and it's the idea of things that circulate within the house, oikos nomos, the law of the house. Whereas the an economic is something that is almost like a stranger that turns up out of the house, out of the blue, a sudden gift. Um, so I wanted to leave you with that. And then just by a very, very practical example, I've been struck by under lockdown of a thing which is somewhere between uh, the growth economy and the gift economy. And it's a thing called the artist's pledge. And I'll, I'll share this with you just because I have artist friends and they, they've told me about this. Of course, at the beginning of lockdown, most artists, as you can imagine, are pretty impecunious as it is. But with lockdown, of course, things are, you know, all the more difficult. People can't go to galleries and some people are worried about their incomes anyway. This guy set up this thing called the, the uh, artist pledge, whereby, you know, say you are a painter. And what you do, you make um, five uh, paintings you sell each painting for 200 pounds, so it's a fixed price. And there's a, obviously a website for this or it's done on Instagram. You make five pieces, you sell each for 200 pounds. When you reach sales of a thousand pounds, having sold the five pieces, your pledge is then to buy one other artwork from one other artist for 200 pounds, which creates a sort of um, an economy for the artists themselves to sustain one another, as well as uh, providing artworks at a reasonable price for the for the general public. I wanted to end with that because I think it's a, a nice idea or a different take on what resources are and how to think about them. One of very many actually creative ideas that lockdown has produced um, about what it means to be in the world and what is genuinely sustainable. Um, these are non-extractive modes of thinking. Um, they are 
it's fair to say they have a kind of certain spiritual quality to them because of this gift like nature that that seems to operate within so anyway i just wanted to give you as i say com from a completely different perspective i'm not talking about investment i'm not talking about kind of global economics but uh, you know one or two models there marx weber and so on as a different way of of thinking about things um, so that's enough for me rabbiting on. For the last few minutes, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to invite uh, David and Phoebe to join the conversation again and really to respond to anything they've heard uh, over the course of the, our discussion or what they are, what they've started to think about now that they weren't thinking about at the beginning of the session. So further comments or questions that they'd like to like to add. David, I can see you're on the screen there. I hope you can uh, still yes, see me. Or... Yeah. Great, okay. Uh, so that, can I come to you first then, David? Is there things that have struck you or questions you have? I think it's, I mean, the word wealth is derived from wheel, which is an old English word for well-being. And I think a lot of people are now starting to realize that. And I think also, you know, what is the purpose of money? And I think for so long, people have just not thought about it. It's probably when you were talking about capitalism, it's just accumulating an amount of money there, really for no fixed purpose, because you had more than enough to do your, your trading or your purchase of, of essential or even luxury goods. Um, so therefore, if you have then got this excess capital, uh, what do you want to do with that? You know, what should be the purpose of that? Is it just uh, to get bigger and bigger uh, in, in size or in amount or do you actually owe a duty uh, to do something with that? And again, I think in the wealth management industry, there's been an obsession about financial returns, which is obviously important. Um, but people often fail to sort of focus on, if you like, the personal enjoyment that you could get from it. And you know, someone might buy uh, a work of art and they might hope that that picture will go up in value, but they also get some pleasure or satisfaction from, from looking at that art. And it could be just, you know, admiring the talent of the painter. It could be a sense of pride, however wrong or good that may be in terms of, well, I own a Monet or a Renoir or whatever. Uh, but, so they get some uh, non-economic value uh, I'm just very conscious of word, using the word economic with Robert around because I'll probably use the wrong term. But anyway, um, so it's, it's what they get from that over and above any increase in value if ever they were to sell that painting or a classic car or whatever. And I think that is something that a lot of people have just forgotten about uh, or maybe never really considered uh, in, in terms of you know, their money and what they do with it. Whereas I think if you are investing that money in a way that is creating a more sustainable future and any one of those definitions that, that we all gave through Menti, um, then I think there's undoubtedly a sense of satisfaction uh, and pleasure and whatever that you feel that your money is doing something over and above just accumulating in value. And certainly uh, people that I have spoken to over the years, once they start to realize that there is this um, value in, in, in seeing what your money can do for, for you and for society and for the environment in a positive way, um, then your level of engagement goes up you know, very, very considerably and it starts to mean something to you. And then it sort of starts to take on a whole sense of purpose. And I think you know, this is what we're trying to sort of awaken in, in, in many, many people. Uh, on your capital, i.e. the money that is not required for your day-to-day -day exchange of goods and services, um, so what can you get for that? So that's my sort of takeaway, I think. Yeah, that's very good. Um, Phoebe, can I come to you as well and ask you, you know, what's, uh, what's been cogitating for you? Yeah, absolutely. And just to build on what David said, I think there really is a reframing of what the investment portfolio is. So the money that you're not using for day-to-day -day exchange, um, what that's generating more than just financial returns and really re reframing uh, the portfolio and building uh, potentially a new relationship with your money. So it's not just um, a conceptual thing that looks to generate a certain return, a certain yield, certain income, but actually it's a collection of companies that you can start to understand and really feel proud about. 
Um, and so by incorporating this concept of sustainability within your investment uh, process and your investment portfolio, you, you can start to, to build that new relationship. And if we think about the spectrum of capital, on one end you have traditional investing, and the other end you have philanthropic um, charitable giving. Traditionally, that's the way that people thought about their money. You would split one way or the other and have some um, combination of, of, of the both. Now, it's very easy to sort of blur the lines in the middle. And I'm not saying don't give money away. That, Like I mentioned on the UN SDGs, there are outcomes that can only be achieved from philanthropic capital, uh, money that's not trying to solve a, uh, or trying to achieve an, an investment return. But it is very possible to invest in companies that are looking to pioneer some of the solutions that we desperately need and also to cap channel capital into the companies that are that are driving change um, and not need to sacrifice um, investment return. So um, if we think of the kind of role of money, um, it's not necessarily uh, an, an end in and of itself um, and it's not necessarily the, the Weber argument whereby you're just giving it away, but it's, it's some other combination of, 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 of the two really. Um, and there's real power in, in doing that and allocating capital to companies that are, that are taking these things seriously because you're funneling capital into the companies that are doing good or, or striving to do better. And it's important that every company is on a journey. There is no perfect company. There is no perfect portfolio. Um, but what you're also doing there is potentially starving companies that aren't taking these issues seriously from capital. Um, and, and increasing their cost of capital by investing, uh, not investing in them, investing in, in, in the rest of the businesses around them. So you're therefore forcing the hand of those companies um, because if there's one thing that, that a boardroom table will be thinking about, it's, it's the share price. And if their share price is being impacted because these companies aren't taking these issues seriously, then they will wake up and, and start to take action. Um, yeah. And you can really drive change uh, through capital markets in that way. Mm. Very interesting. I like your spectrum as well on that kind of, um, you know, muddy ground in the middle. Um, now, I'm very conscious of time and, and we are going to let people go before the top of the hour. But I just wanted to ask, uh, David, if you had any further thoughts you'd like to add before we, we do bring things to a close? Not really. I, I think it's just encouraging everyone to, to just give it some more thought as we all have got a bit of time in our hands still semi-lockdown i'm not really sure what but um i think just to reflect on that and just figure out what it is that we can all do as individuals and i think it's the personal responsibility area it's not just relying on other people to do it you've got to do something yourself yeah it's a positive action yes. yeah no well said and i think that's true isn't it lockdown for, you know, among its many very strange aspects has given us a bit of space, hasn't it, to, to yeah. reflect on certain things. Yeah. Um, and Phoebe, any final thoughts for you? And I think you're going to sort of officially close the session, but anything further you'd like to add sort of content wise before we do that? No, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to sort of squeeze anything, anything else in at this stage. Um, you, you know where we are. It's, it's a conversation to be had, as David said, it's something to start thinking about. Um, it is a different way of, of thinking of investing. Um, but I actually think that David's going to um, sign off. Sorry oh, for the confusion. Okay. <laughs> I'll pass it to David. Thank you. Thank you. You've gone the whole way around. Uh, well, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Robert, for your uh, participation and, and very useful thoughts as ever. Uh, it always helps to sort of take a different uh, perspective on things. And I think you've certainly done that very well today and indeed in times past. So thank you for your contribution. Uh, thank you, Phoebe, for your slides and presentation as well. Hopefully it starts to sort of uh, awaken those thoughts in all of us. And thank you to all of you for joining and taking the time to uh, share some of these thoughts with us. And as I say, you know where we are. So thank you very much again. Okay, that's all from us. Bye now. <laughs>